Dear students, I am Dr. Deepa Dubey, Associate Professor at the Rajiv Gandhi School of Intellectual Property Law, IIT Kharagpur. Today, the module on which I will talk is Introduction to Criminal Justice. Before we proceed, let us know the learning outcomes. To make the learners understand the aims and purposes of criminal justice, to make the students acquainted with the fundamentals of criminal justice, third to make the learners understand the process and approaches to criminal justice. An understanding of criminal justice necessitates an overview of the entire gamut of crimes, criminal law and criminal justice process and administration. It is a complex phenomena dominated by different social and political systems and the values underlying them. In this module, an attempt will be made to introduce the basic aspects underlying the criminal justice with focus on the purposes, approaches, models and fundamentals of the same. They may differ from country to country. Nevertheless, these reflect the larger thought processes governing the criminal justice system. The aims of criminal law and criminal justice. Criminal law is an instrument of social control. It tends to regulate harmful, pernicious and antisocial behavior in society. It thereby prohibits undesirable and harmful human conduct and punishes the perpetrators for the violations so committed. Pillai maintains that the essential object of criminal law is to protect society against criminals and lawbreakers. For this purpose, the law holds out threats of punishment to prospective lawbreakers as well as attempts to make the actual offender suffer the prescribed punishments for the crime. Nigel Walker has listed out the purposes of criminal law to include the following. The protection of the human person against intentional violence, the protection of people against some forms of unintended harm, the protection of easily persuadable classes of people against abuse of their persons or property, the prevention of acts which are regarded as unnatural, the prevention of acts which tend to shock other people, next the discouragement of behavior which might provoke disorder, the protection of property against theft, fraud or damage, the defense of the state, the protection of social institutions. Criminal law thus seeks to prohibit behavior that represents a serious wrong against an individual or against some fundamental social value or institution. The responsibility is on the state to ensure the regulation of the society in accordance with the laws and thereby protect individuals and property, etc., as well as prevent the occurrence of such behavior. A set of agencies and processes are thus formulated by the state to achieve this end. Criminal justice refers to the set of agencies and processes established by governments to control crime and impose penalties on those who violate laws. The purpose of the criminal justice system is to deliver justice for all by convicting and punishing the guilty and helping them to stop offending while protecting the innocent. It seeks to deliver an efficient, effective, accountable and fair justice process for the public. Andrew Sanders and Richard Young writes, criminal justice is a complex social institution which regulates 
potential alleged and actual criminal activity within procedural limits supposed to protect people from wrongful treatment and wrongful conviction. Agencies of the criminal justice. Most criminal justice systems have five agencies, police, prosecution, defense lawyers, courts and correctional administration. The police are primarily engaged in the task of prevention, detection and investigation of crimes. They take reports for crimes and investigate them. The police are empowered to arrest offenders, interrogate them, conduct search and seizures and thereby gather evidences for the crime. Prosecutors are lawyers who are appointed by the state to represent the latter in criminal cases. They review the evidences brought before them by the police and proceed with the filing of charges before the court. They present evidence in court, question witnesses and press the guilt of the accused. The defense lawyers defend the accused against the charges drawn against him by the state. They are generally hired by the accused themselves, except in exceptional cases where they are assigned by the court. While the prosecutor represents the state, the defense lawyer represents the accused at the trial. The courts are the agencies which are entitled to decide on the innocence or guilt of the accused. They ensure that appropriate charges are put on the accused, they evaluate the law and evidences put before them and finally pass an appropriate order based on appreciation of facts, law and evidence. They determine the sentence to be imposed on convicts as well as decide on issues of release of offenders on bail, probation, etc. Correctional administration refers to the system established by the state for the custody of convicted offenders. The correction officers are entrusted with the task of supervising the prisons or correctional homes where the convicted prisoners serve the custodial sentences passed by the courts. They are required to ensure the safety and security of the convicts as well as provide adequate facilities for their reformation and rehabilitation. The adversarial and inquisitorial systems. There are two broad approaches to criminal justice fact finding, the adversarial and the inquisitorial. Adversarial criminal justice is associated with common law systems in countries such as Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, United Kingdom and India. Inquisitorial criminal justice is associated with civil law systems in countries such as Germany and France. In an inquisitorial system, the dominant role in conducting a criminal inquiry is supposed to be played by the court. A dossier is prepared to enable the judge taking the case to master its details. The judge then makes decisions about which witnesses to call and examines them in person with the prosecution and the defense lawyers consigned to a subsidiary role. In some inquisitorial systems, the dossier is prepared by an examining magistrate with wide investigative powers, but more frequently this is done by the prosecutor and police. In the adversarial system, the burden of preparing the case falls on the parties themselves. The judge acts as a mere umpire, 
listening to the evidences produced by the parties, ensuring that the proceedings are conducted with procedural propriety and announcing a decision at the conclusion of the case. If the parties choose not to call a certain witness, then howsoever relevant that person's evidence might have been, there is nothing the court can do about it. Indeed, it is sometimes said that adversarial systems focus on proof and inquisitorial systems on truth. However, adversary system holds that truth is best discovered by powerful statements on both sides of the question which are then evaluated by a passive and impartial adjudication. In simple terms therefore, the, the prosecution and the defense bring evidences before a magistrate who decides the case based on the evidence and argument presented by the parties, whereas in the other, the prosecutor or police officer assembles the case or the dossier as it is called, but the judge calls the witnesses and examines them. Next coming to models of criminal justice. Herbert Packer developed two models of criminal justice process, namely the crime control model and the due process model in order to illuminate what he saw as the conflicting value systems in criminal process. The value system that underlies the crime control model is based on the proposition that the repression of criminal conduct is by far the most important function to be performed by the criminal process. The failure of law enforcement to bring criminal conduct under tight control is viewed as leading to the breakdown of public order and tends to the disappearance of an important condition of human freedom. The crime control model requires that primary attention be paid to the efficiency with which the criminal process operates to screen suspects, determine guilt and secure appropriate dispositions of persons convicted of crime. The term efficiency in this context refers to the capacity of the system to apprehend, try, convict and dispose of a high proportion of criminal offenders. The criminal process in this model is seen as a screening process in which each successive state pre-arrest, investigation, arrest, post-arrest, investigation, preparation for trial, trial, etc. All these involves a series of routinized operations whose success is gauged primarily by their tendency to pass the case along to a successful conclusion. The presumption of guilt is what makes it possible for the system to deal efficiently with large numbers as the crime control model demands. On the other, the due process model stresses on the possibility of error. People are notoriously poor observers of disturbing events. The more emotion rousing the context, the greater the possibility that recollection will be incorrect. Confessions and admissions by persons in police custody may be induced by physical or psychological coercion. Witnesses may be animated by bias or interest. Considerations of this kind lead to a rejection of informal fact-finding processes as definitive of factual guilt and to an insistence on informal adjudicative adversary fact-finding processes in which the factual case against the accused is publicly heard by an impartial tribunal and is evaluated only after the accused has had a full opportunity to discredit the case against him. Judicial officers are supposed to operate 
on a presumption of innocence, meaning that they must ignore the presumption of guilt in their treatment of the accused. Now coming to the fundamentals of criminal justice. It is often customary to start a discussion on the fundamentals of criminal justice on the maxim nallam crimen sine lege, nallam pona sine lege, no crime without law, no punishment without law, known as the principle of legality. It signifies that an individual may not be criminally punished for an act that was not clearly condemned in a statute prior to the time that the individual committed the act. In other words, all wrongful behavior must be criminalized and all punishments established before the commencement of any criminal prosecution. Dicey wrote, Englishmen are ruled by law alone. A man may with us be punished for a breach of law, but can be punished for nothing else. The principle of legality is a phrase which is powerfully righteous and invoked in the minimal sense of being governed by rules which are fixed, knowable and certain, thereby enhancing liberty and reducing arbitrariness by the state's organs. This is a fundamental principle with both procedural and substantive implications. The connotations of the principle of legality are wide ranging. Hall discusses the three basic elements of the principle which fall under the maxim. First, that no conduct may be held criminal unless it is precisely defined in a penal law. A corollary of this element is the requirement that penal statutes be strictly construed. Finally, the maxim commands that penal laws are not to be given retroactive effect. Halevi adds a fourth principle to it and which is basic to criminal justice, the presumption of innocence. The principle of non-retroactivity means that no person shall be punished except in pursuance of a statute which fixes a penalty for a criminal conduct. The underlying reason for the revulsion against retroactive penal law is that it is unjust that what was legal when done should be subsequently held criminal that was punishable with a certain sanction when committed should later on be punished more severely. That procedural changes seriously disadvantageous to an accused should be applied retrospectively. As stated by Hobbes, no law made after a fact done can make it a crime, for before the law there is no transgression of the law. The principle of maximum certainty. If the law is certain and definite, people can regulate their conduct or behavior in order to avoid the hazard of falling within the grip of penal law. This principle lays down an injunction to the legislators not to lay down the law in broad general terms so that everybody and anybody could be brought within its ambit at the whims of the prosecuting authorities or the judge. As stated by Lord Macaulay, uniformity where you can have it, diversity where you must have it, but in all cases certainty. This principle of certainty emphasizes on predictability, certainty, and fair warning which guarantees respect for a citizen as a rational and autonomous individual. He is not caught unawares, but is warned of the criminal law provisions. Certainty also ensures that the police and other agencies involved in criminal justice administration do not misuse the powers 
bestowed on them, but are clearly and unambiguously limited within the confines of the criminal law provisions. When criminal offences are drafted in vague and ambiguous ways, citizens are not only faced with unpredictable behaviour by enforcement officials, they are also denied a fair opportunity to avoid punishment. Such a denial flouts in the words of Andrew Ashworth, an incontrovertible minimum of respect for the principle of autonomy. Next, the principle of strict construction. This may be stated as a third principle under the umbrella of legality. This principle relates to the court's task of interpreting legislation. The general rule is that a penal statute should be strictly interpreted. That is, if two possible and reasonable constructions can be put upon a provision, the court must lean towards a construction which exempts the subject from penalty rather than the one which imposes a penalty. It is not competent for the court to stretch the meaning of an expression used by the legislature in order to carry out the intention of the legislature. It is for the legislature and not for the court to define a crime and provide for its punishment. Coming to the presumption of innocence, that is a fundamental principle of criminal jurisprudence which asserts that a person should be presumed innocent unless and until proved guilty. Justice Dixon laid down that the presumption of innocence is a hallowed principle lying at the very heart of criminal law. The presumption of innocence protects the fundamental liberty and human dignity of any and every person accused by the state of criminal conduct. An individual charged with a criminal offence faces grave social and personal consequences including potential loss of physical liberty, subjection to social stigma and ostracism from the community as well as other social, psychological and economic harms. In light of the gravity of these consequences, the presumption of innocence is crucial. It ensures that until the state proves an accused's guilt beyond all reasonable doubt, he or she is innocent. This is essential in a society committed to fairness and social justice. The presumption of innocence confirms our faith in humankind. It reflects our belief that individuals are decent and law-abiding members of the community until it is proved otherwise. The rule as it stands enumerates that a person who is charged must be proved guilty. The accused stands innocent until he is proved guilty and his proof of guilt must displace all reasonable doubt. In saying that the accused person shall be proved guilty, it says also that he shall not be presumed guilty, that he shall be convicted only upon legal evidence, not tried upon prejudice, that he shall not be made the victim of circumstances or of suspicion which surround him. He shall be convicted not upon any mere presumption, any taking matters for granted on the strength of suspicion, but he shall be proved guilty by legal evidence and by legal evidence which is clear and strong, that is clear beyond reasonable doubt. Apart from this, there are certain other basic considerations which govern the working of the criminal justice process. These include the rule against 
double jeopardy, the right against self-incrimination and fair trial. Double jeopardy means that a man cannot be put twice in jeopardy for the same offence. In R versus Miles 1890, the court held that where a criminal charge has been adjudicated upon by a court having jurisdiction to hear and determine it, that adjudication whether it takes the form of an acquittal or conviction is final as to the matter so adjudicated upon and may be pleaded as bar to any subsequent prosecution for the same offence. In order to determine whether in a particular case such a plea would be available, it is necessary to ask three questions. First, was the accused in jeopardy on the first indictment? Secondly, was there a final verdict? And thirdly, was the previous charge substantially the same as the present one? If the answers to these questions are in the affirmative, the plea will succeed. Right against self-incrimination, an ancillary to the presumption of innocence is the right to silence. The right to silence is a principle of common law which means that normally courts should not be encouraged to conclude that a suspect or an accused is guilty merely because he has refused to respond to questions put to him by the police or the court. It is based on the principle nemo debet prodier ipsum, the privilege against self-incrimination. The privilege against self-incrimination confers immunity from an obligation to provide information tending to prove one's own guilt. A person is not bound to answer any questions or produce any document or thing if that material would have the tendency to expose the person to conviction for a crime. A number of rationales justify the existence of the privilege. It is intended to maintain a proper balance between the powers of the state and the rights and interests of citizens. Historically, in societies where freedom from self-incrimination was not available, coercive means were used to compel a person to speak. The privilege is also intended to protect the adversarial system of criminal justice. The presumption of innocence until proven guilty underpins the privilege against self-incrimination. Those who allege an individual's guilt should not be able to compel them to give evidence against themselves. Further, individuals are to be protected from being confronted by the cruel trilemma of punishment which refers to witness having to choose between refusing to answer questions, thereby risking punishment for contempt, answering honestly, thereby providing evidence of guilt or lying, thereby risking punishment for perjury. As stated by Murphy in one of the cases, the privilege against self-incrimination is a human right based on the desire to protect personal freedom and human dignity. Lastly, coming to the concept of fair trial, one principal object of criminal law is to protect society by punishing the offenders. However, justice and fair play require that no one be punished without a fair trial. A person might be under thick cloud of suspicion of guilt. He might have been caught red-handed and yet 
he is not to be punished unless and until he is tried and adjudged to be guilty by a competent court. In the administration of justice, it is of prime importance that justice should not only be done, but must also appear to have been done. Therefore, it becomes imperative that every person accused of crime is brought before the court for trial and that all the evidence appearing against him is made available to the court for deciding as to his guilt or innocence. There is no easy answer to the question as to what makes a trial fair. The concept encapsulates within it a broad range of rights which spreads throughout the pre-trial, trial and sentencing stage. At the core of these is the fact that the parties to the case must have equal opportunity of being heard. There should not be any discrimination or bias in the process and the system should respond fairly to both the parties. That being so, in criminal trials, fairness is attached with the presumption of innocence of the accused and therefore, unless the charges are proved beyond reasonable doubt in a court of law by means of admissible legal evidence, the accused is entitled to an acquittal. Furthermore, the presumption of innocence implies a right to be treated in accordance with the principle. It is therefore, the duty of the authorities to refrain from prejudging the outcome of the trial or act in a manner discriminatory to the accused. Fairness also emphasizes on information, accessibility and fair treatment. Hence, the accused is entitled to know as of right the charges framed against him. He must be communicated at the time of arrest, the exact grounds on which he is being arrested. Another concomitant is the requirement of adequate representation of the accused in court. Any person accused of an offence before a criminal court has the right to be defended by a lawyer. Such right extends not only at the time the proceedings are actually going on, but also prior to the initiation of the same. If the accused is in police custody, he should be given access to legal advice. Thirdly, even in the course of a criminal investigation and trial, the accused continues to enjoy the fundamental rights and freedoms albeit with some limitations. The accused has to be treated with dignity and respect. No inhuman treatment can be meted out to him in course of the proceedings. It also signifies that persons arrested, detained or otherwise in the hands of the authorities have the right to be treated in a humane manner and without being subjected to any psychological or physical violence, duress or intimidation. In India, each of these basic principles have been incorporated in the criminal justice system of the country. Thus, Article 20 of the Indian Constitution provides for non-retrospectivity, double jeopardy and self-incrimination. An accused has a constitutional right to challenge any law or provision thereof which violates any of the above. The provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure 1973, the Indian Evidence Act 1872, both the legislations incorporate various provisions which provide the basis of fair trial investigation as well as rules of evidence in criminal trials. Thus, an exploration of criminal justice 
forays into myriad terrains of crime, criminal law, liability, etc. It requires a deep understanding of the values governing the system and the working of the agencies. Criminal justice also requires an appreciation of the fundamental principles. Since the very nature of criminal law is deterrent and repressive, it becomes important that the system acts with fairness, protecting the interests of individuals and society on the one hand and that of the accused on the other provides a challenging task for the criminal justice and an effective balancing of the conflicting interests require that due recognition be given to the principles of legality, self-incrimination, double jeopardy, etc. Thank you.